My name is Timothy Young, and I serve as Curator of Modern Books and Manuscripts at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University. The piece selected for this virtual festival gallery installment is Notes on Form and Art by George Eliot. Beinecke Library's George Eliot and George Henry Lewis collection came about principally due to the academic passions of Gordon Sherman Haight, professor of English at Yale from 1950 to 1968. He was the author of George Eliot, a biography, and the editor of the George Eliot Letters. This text is found in a notebook by Eliot, which contains writings from the 1850s and 1860s. It was purchased by Yale University in 1950 from the estate of Gabriel Wells, a well-known antiquarian bookseller in New York City in the first part of the 20th century. The notebook joined a collection of material about the life and work of Eliot, gathered by Chauncey Brewster Tinker, who served for many years as Yale's keeper of rare books. This notebook is somewhat curious in that Eliot wrote from both the front and from the back. Starting from the front, we have poetry, and then from the back, we have prose. Much of this material was unpublished when the notebook entered Yale's collections in 1950. Most of the poems were, however, published later that decade. They include In a London Drawing Room, Ex Oriente Lux, I Grant You Ample Leave, and a number of fragments. In the prose section, in addition to Notes on Form and Art from 1868, we find versification from 1869 and a group of transcribed mottos, that is, short phrases that precede chapters in a novel that Eliot had created for Felix Holt, Middlemarch, and Daniel Deronda. Notes on Form and Art was published in 1963 in the essays of George Eliot. What I love about it is like, on the one hand, it's like it has this kind of magic quality, for me at least, of being a kind of big reader of George Eliot, but um, at the same time, it's just a notebook. Like it's just, you know, it's just a, a woman's writing, drafting, okay, it's like a fair copy. She didn't clearly make too many kind of hesitations or corrections, but um, it is just a notebook. It's, that's all it is. That's what makes me also think that is also what, just what writing is. It's kind of, it's free, you know, relatively free. You need a notebook or some paper, a pencil, a pen, and you write, and this is, that's what she did. How do you feel about, you know, encountering primary materials like this, does, does that mean anything to you apart from what the words say? Or do you, do you feel that it's just, uh, just a piece of paper? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> no, these things mean nothing to me. Um, and I was telling you, I once wrote a book about Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was my, one of my great heroes, and the uh, suffrage historian Ellen Du Bois at UCLA, she offered to take me to Huntington, to the Huntington Library, in Pasadena, where she said she had a treat for me, which was Elizabeth Stanton's letters in her own uh, handwriting. It was so awful. <laughs> she was so unreadable, so illegible. I thought I would sit there with a magnifying glass until I dropped. And, she, and Ellen was so surprised because for her, an academic scholar, sitting over stuff like this was reverential. <laughs> But for me, oh, please give me a legible transcript. <laughs> the handwriting uh, is, is exceptional. And the, the image of the handwriting, I think that's, I almost like that more than the handwriting itself is the, the sort of the way that that um, handwriting is time um, and is thinking in this way. Uh, and it, it's so, it, it feels sad the way that that handwriting is not something that is is actually very customary uh, these days, and, and the, we're sort of like losing sight of that uh, that sort of like visual production of the the body thinking. There are two more specific things that I really like about it, and one is that when she's talking about form and how form grows, how it, um, how it emerges. She talks about a stone, a rock, and she talks about a snail and its vulnerable body, and she talks about the human body. So there's this sense of form being not solely um, in the kind of rarefied zone of art making or writing, um, but 
form and form giving kind of happening in all kinds of spheres of, of activity all the time. We're encountering forms. Yeah, the thing that I guess speaks to me most in relation to the long form, this book I'm, I'm trying to finish, is that um, she thinks of form as a set of relations where uh, the relations are of mutual dependence. And that interests me too. So that rather than form being this kind of bounded, bounded shape, this bounded object that's kind of decontextualized and kind of, you know, uh, separated from, from the space of its making or its encounter, it's like she's really important to her to kind of embed it in, in, a, in all of the other factors, like the rock. What are the other factors that make the rock uh, the, the shape it is? You know, there's the weather, <laughs> there's how rock behaves. There's so I I have to say I I really I'm really attached to this essay. I, I guess what I sort of parsed out from it was this interesting conundrum about I guess wholeness versus partness. <laughs> um, the question of is having a form at all creating a, a, a division that's arbitrary or that's um, perhaps not helpful or not necessary? Or, or is it necessary and helpful because that's the way we need to understand things, right? Because I, I felt like what she was saying wasn't so much that she wanted to reimagine the idea of form and say, hey, form bad. It didn't feel like there was a vibe, it was more wait, let's not assume that we know. Mm. And I feel like as an artist, having, being able to, to not get too comfortable in your understanding of things is essential, you know? Like you have to be able to question what you know, what you see, what you think you see. And it seemed like she was really actively trying to do that and sort of obsess, obsessed with asking really basic questions, you know? So the interesting thing to me about this George Eliot piece was that I found it completely impenetrable and yet its impenetrability is to me feels like the form for content that I cannot quite penetrate. I'm reading form but I'm not reading content but the content is the form but the form is not delivering the content to me in a way that I can to then make anything of. It kind of reminds me of A Strange Loop, mm. which was, you know, I wrote a musical called A Strange Loop, but part of that title comes from Douglas Hofstadter talking about the concept of The Strange Loop, which then entails him having to talk about the meaning of symbols that then make up what A Strange Loop is, which is in itself, to try to describe it, is almost an ever uh, burrowing down and firing back up then on itself. And so this piece that was kind of like my experience of first encountering the notion of a strange loop, because it's almost like you're looking into a mirror's reflection of a mirror mm -hmm. and trying to get to like the origin. And I think because of the nature of form and the way that she is describing it, it's like you have to like, take the journey all the way to like the origin, which is like quite a journey mm. in this piece. The, the language, the rhetoric in the George Eliot piece is like the opposite of what I would want to hear. I, I, would, I would want it, her to sort of empty out what form is rather than sort of like pack it in. It's like the opposite of, of what I want form to be. You know, you have notes which are this kind of idea of something provisional and tentative and but then on form in art, you know, like on form, like this ancient, as she says, you know, this kind of ancient concept, question, conundrum, what is what is form? How do we talk about form? How does form take form? And then in art, and you discover, okay, she's interested in in maybe primarily in poetry in this essay, but like art as a general category, like kind of how I'd love to sort of cultivate the boldness to um, to have a title like that, you know, form in art, like to, to sort of propose to, maybe that's something you could only do in the 19th century, sort of to propose to kind of answer everything or to offer an approach to kind of the biggest, biggest questions, the biggest general categories. <laughs>